Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Breaking news before we get to our topic. And our topic today is how to choose a real estate broker, 11 must ask questions. And by the way, these very same questions will work when you're trying to decide if you're going to stay at your current real estate brokerage. So get ready to take notes. Um, and Julie has read something this morning, I think that will motivate all of you. Yes, I actually have read it in several places. I think, you know, this time of year, there's lots of surveys bouncing around. And I believe this can be attributed to both Housing Wire and the Mortgage Bankers Association, who both report that 40% of Americans say that they will be moving this year. And so my question to all of our podcast listeners who are in the real estate space, have you spoken with 40% of your <laughs> database, 40% of the people who are in the contacts of your smartphone, 40% of your friends and family? I mean, 100% would be better, but let's just say 40% of them are going to move. The only question is, will they be using you to help them? Well, so if you are thinking along the lines of what Julie was just prescribing to all of you, you might want to be considering having more conversations with folks where you end the conversation with one of our catchphrases, basically, or one of our uh, copywritten um, scripts, which is simply, by the way, who do you know who's thinking about buying or selling real estate that I should be helping in this market? Now, we would suggest that you say, by the way, who do you know who's thinking about selling that I should be helping in this market? And you will be shocked and surprised, or hopefully not shocked and surprised, when you start stumbling across lead after lead. Because remember, statistically, assuming this data is correct, 40% of everyone you're going to talk to, Julie says centers of influence and past clients, but it's everybody, is thinking about Humans. Um, buying and selling. <laughs> and depending on the price range, they might be thinking about listing and then buying. You guys following us here? So the bottom line is have conversations. What is a conversation for those of you who have forgotten? It is not a tweet. It is not a message. It is not an SMS. It is not a video. It is not a tweet, a ticker talker or whatever you, whatever you kids TikTok-er. call it. Ticker talker. What's it called? TikTok. TikTok. It's not a, a Facebook. smoke signal. It's not a smoke <laughs> signal. It's not a Facebook post. It's not leaving a present on their door of like some sort of pop by type thing. It is a actual conversation where you pick up the phone and have a conversation that is, you know, use the scripts we include with our premier coaching program. Our conversational scripts are, are not uh, salesy and they're designed to make it so that they look forward to hearing from you on a regular monthly basis. If you really want to step away from the crowd, the herd of uh, people who are li- relying too heavily on digital forms of communication, call people. Who actually is making that effort right now, I'll tell you who, the top producing agents, the agents that have all the listings. For sure. When everybody else is going one direction, guys, when the herd is running in one direction, generally speaking, nobody in that herd is really paying attention to the fact that everyone, all the uh, you know buffalo leading the pack are going off the cliff. So you want to make sure you're not just following the masses off the cliff. Think about what we're saying. If everyone else is doing everything digitally, that means that your past clients, your centers of influence, everyone you run across is so immune, burned out, oversaturated with digital communication, an actual conversation is going to make the biggest of differences. Now, we do suggest you do the digital stuff, but don't do the digital stuff thinking that somehow it's going to get you anywhere near the same results as having real communication. So if there were to be a homework assignment, I'm going to give you two homework assignments for this weekend, and then we're going to get to our first point. Number one, have intentional conversations every time you converse with anybody Get in the habit of always end, ending every conversation with, oh, by the way, who do you think, who do you know who's thinking about selling that I should be helping in this market? And number two, we did just have a, a change of the month. And uh, as always, we suggest you guys go after the expired listings. If you've not ever worked expires before and you don't know how to do it, let me just sell it to you this way. It is a seller who has absolutely wants to sell the house who knows what the price isn't or the condition isn't or the location isn't. So there's a known problem with the house could most likely be one of those three things. Certainly one of those three things. Um, You know, they're willing to list with an agent. You know, they're willing to pay a commission. Those are some of the best listing leads you're going to get. Oh, but Tim, there's no expireds Mm -hmm. in my market. You're not looking large enough. You're not looking for a big enough circumference around your particular, whatever you determine your market to be. Look in your entire city. You will find pockets of expires everywhere. They all will need your help to sell the house. They will all uh, result in you receiving a paycheck. 
Oh, but but Tim, I look all over my market and there's 25 expireds. Okay, great. There's 25 expireds. How many of those do you have to list to make this a fantastic year for you? How about going after old expireds? How many people in your marketplace were expired or withdrawn at the end of last year who said to you know themselves mostly in their listing agents or formal listing agents, I'm going to relist in the spring. Well, what is this? Not really for most of you in the Northwest, I get it. But this is getting close to the spring. So call these folks. Call, call, call. Don't mail. Call. Don't find them on Facebook. Call. And, you know, there's various sources we tell you that you can utilize to find the phone numbers for you. And then when if they do happen to say, well, I'm going to relist in the spring, ask them exactly what that means to them. And why the spring? And why the spring? And if it were an advantage to you, Mr. Seller, to have the house for a sale now, like a clear, distinct financial advantage, an undisputed, you know, significant financial advantage, would you still want to wait to the spring? And most, time, most times the sellers are going to say no. Learn our scripts. Learn how to be a real estate professional. Well, I can tell you, Tim, our coaching clients are reporting just the most amazing stories because they are making those contacts, especially with people who have said, I wanted to wait till after the holidays or I wanted to wait until spring because they're calling with examples of sales that have recently happened because inventory is low, where they thought that they were really pushing their luck at say 550 and they ended up closing at 650 or 700. Why? Because it was the only thing for sale because there were competing offers, but you're not gonna have that if you're not making contacts. There's so many great scripts that we're giving you guys as part of our premier coaching program to motivate a seller to not wait until whatever their, you know, April or May, whatever they say spring is. How about this one? The Fed has already said there's going to be an interest rate hike in March, and there's going to be potentially a four or five this year. Do you think, Mr. Seller, that's going to result in more buyers or fewer buyers? You know, would you like to be putting your house for sale now and say then mid-year? I'm sorry, you said you want to put your house for sale in April because that's your determination of what spring is. Let's say you don't uh, close out until June. That means you're going to be refi or you're going to be getting a new mortgage in July after two or three more rate hikes. Doesn't it make sense, Mr. Seller, for you to move up your plans by two or three months now and get your house sold? Also to speak to the person that maybe has a real time frame, like maybe they're building a house or whatever, you know. Okay, so here's the thing, cash out now, and because the sellers are in absolute control in a low inventory market, our coaching clients are reporting very creative deals, right? So you can either close and do a lease back, you can have a longer closing time, you can still lock in your rate. You've got to think out of the traditional box to put these transactions together, but the good news is, as a listing agent, you and your seller have all the control in the world. I've had uh, four and five month out closings. I've had people contingent on seller finding suitable housing, but they've got 90 days to do it in. They've got close now, lease back. There's all of these different options. And if you are not astute at having those conversations, you need to come to our coaching, which we have every single day and ask that question. How do I deal with a seller who says, I would list with you now, but I don't know what I'm going to buy or I'm not comfortable with the time frame? Your answer cannot be, well, I'll call you in a couple months because somebody's going to answer that seller's question and that problem and resolve that. Do you guys see the difference between what Julie and I and our, all of our coaches and our staff do versus essentially what you're being exposed to? We're not just focusing all on lead generation because here's the thing that no one wants to tell you. Leads are the easiest damn thing to get in real estate. The very fact that you're paying for them is honestly, it's insanity. Here's the reason that leads are the easiest thing to get in real estate. I want you to think of one human that you know right now that does not need a place to live. Tell me one. Every single person you know is a potential real estate lead as defined by the people that are selling you leads. You know, and for, we already know 40% of the folks out there are thinking about buying or selling real estate this year. And you have to assume that probably more than 50% of those 40% are going to have houses to sell. So you're talking about a tremendous amount of listings that could be coming for sale. This is when it becomes a skills-based market. This is when all the rubber meets the road. This is when all the gimmicks and the shiny objects, they start to show themselves what they are, which are basically just, you know, goofy things that agents do who are trying to avoid doing the real work of real estate. And guys, you know better than that at this point. You are smart enough to have chosen real estate as your career. You're selling something, and you are selling, by the way, you are selling something that every single human needs. Uh, that is unlike virtually every other kind of product or service you can conceive of. So good job.
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> now you've got to do something with That's it. That's right. So by the way, if you want to join our premier coaching program, we've made it very easy for you. You can skip the line. Um, every single month, we allow 100 agents to join. Why only 100? Well, the answer is quite simple because this is a coaching program. You are receiving a daily semi-private coaching call with one of our new member coaches. We can only handle so many agents joining every month. That's really the bottom line. And if you want to join now and you want to skip the line, just text the word premier, you know, premier. P, how do you spell premier? P-R-E-M-I-E-R. <laughs> right. To 47372. Text the word premier. P-R-E-M-I-E-R. To 47372, and you'll be taken directly to our Premier Coaching page. And you can join Premier for around $100 a month, depending on how you decide to join. It's completely up to you. So go ahead and text the word Premier. P-R-E-M-I-E-R. See how I got Julie helping me with the commercials now? <laughs> to 47372. And again, you guys can go ahead and skip the line and join a Premier Coaching right away. All right, so let's get to our topic. Yes, another one of those things that we get asked all the time. We're talking about choosing your broker, changing brokers. How do you know when it's time to be having these thoughts? Well, point number one, and we hear this all the time. Point number one, your personal income has been flat or worse in decline. Maybe you're doing the same volume, give or take, year in and year out, but you seem stuck. Now, when I went back to this point, Tim, I was thinking agents get stuck at different points. You can get stuck with failure to launch in the first place. A lot of people get stuck right in that three to $5 million category, uh, volume category. And then we have agents like 10 to 15 million where they figured out how to do that, but they can't seem to break away from that pattern year after year. So really you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to keep getting what you're getting, or you're going to slide backwards because the market's changing on you. Most agents, most newer agents, new and newer agents, all the, the, the common mistake they make is choosing a local mom and pop brick and mortar location thinking that they're going to be mother hand by that mom and pop and they're going to help them and nurture them along and they're going to be, you know, their real estate mentors. And to some extent, that's probably true. But the biggest, again, we hear this constantly, is I'm not getting the care and feeding or the support that I thought I was going to get from the brokerage I yes, joined. That's right. And it's not necessarily their fault. It's because they're not, they're probably selling real estate themselves. They have to keep their lights on as well. You're not going to be a priority in their real estate business. They're not designed to offer coaching and training and support of new agents. And so new agents will then fail out of the business. And oftentimes, and this is where, frankly, it, it's sad, is they'll blame themselves or, as, you know, they'll write themselves off. They'll say, well, you know what? I joined this local brokerage. It didn't work out for me. I'm just going to give up on ever having in my own business or I'm just not going to take the opportunity to sell real estate as seriously I otherwise would have. In other words, you made the wrong decision which brokerage to join and you have now decided to write yourself off in your potential. Huge mistake. So if you made the wrong decision, stop making that wrong decision by staying where you are. It's time for you to move. You're not going to, 99% of the time, the small brokerages are not going to be able to support new agents or agents who are going to want to be more aggressive in building their businesses. They're just not, it's too expensive, frankly, and there's not enough margin for them on your transactions. The technology that agents and brokerages have to employ nowadays to be competitive at any level, most, even small, medium-sized brokerages, mm -hmm. they simply can't do it. That's the reason there's so many large, dominant real estate brands out there. All right, point number two. Point number two, you are the best agent in your office. Now, that might be awesome for you. That's fantastic. But if you are not being challenged and you continue to be the, at the top, you think that's a great thing for a couple of years, and then you kind of get bored with that. And you go, well, how can I be the top agent? I only did like three deals last month. You might need to make a change. Well, let's go into point number three, because these all kind of yes, fall into the same category. Point number three. Okay, your colleagues, broker or brokerage in general, are too negative or are becoming too negative. And I am seeing this crop up with this whole inflation thing happening in the low inventory story. I had an agent, one of actually one of the people in our EXP family, she said that um, she's trying to nurture an agent, but all he gets told by his current brokerage is, well, there's not enough to go around and you're just going to have to wait for the market to change. Negative, negative, not enough opportunity. Why would you believe that when there were 6 million transactions last year, even with low inventory? So if you're coming into negativity with colleagues, broker, brokerage in general, you got to get out of there. That's not good for you. So these first three things all fall into the category of environment. And really, if you think about this, I'm going to tell them a true story. Sure. All right. So Julie and I are basically, Julie is a middle class kid from Columbus, Ohio, and I'm a poor kid from Columbus, Ohio. So as I tell you guys the story, 
I need to set that ground, the, you know, shared understanding between us and the tens of thousands of you listening. So you understand how extraordinary the story I'm about to share with you is just to put it in perspective. We did not understand the significance of environment until we were well into our 20s, like our late 20s. We had heard, well, your environment matters and all the rest of it, but we did not understand how extraordinarily important your environment is. So Julie and I now live in Puerto Rico. We live at the Ritz-Carlton in Dorado, uh, Puerto Rico, and it is extraordinary. And we are going on a walk yesterday to the beach. We live about probably 10 minutes from the beach. Yes. Now, well, I'm not, walking 10 minutes, yes. I'm not going to say names. No, I, it's I know okay. It, I, you're giving me a No, no, I didn't know what story we were going to, to go into. And I'm smiling because I, I thought it was remarkable as well. Well, because we have a lot of stories we could share. Yes. I mean, like you tripping over Ricky Martin and all the rest I of I like it. that story. That's yeah, I bet one. you do. <laughs> well, anyway, so we're down looking at the ocean. This was uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. Walking Maximus, our giant Frenchie. Yeah, our giant Frenchie. And... There's a, a guy in his early 40s there with his two little kids in a golf cart looking at the view. And Mac and his little daughter thought Maximus was the cutest thing ever because he pretty much is. is. <laughs> and, um, you know, we didn't. We, so I just started talking to him. Julie was catching up after having visited with some other folks. And we're talking. And it turns out, and again, I'm not going to mention his name. Nope. This guy sold his company. He's like 42 or something. He sold his company for $4.5 billion. Billion with a B. Yeah, billion with a B. And we knew what his company was. Like, we heard of it. Julie uses this, uh, yes. let's just say it's Now, a, we didn't recognize him because of no. that. He was just some guy out on his golf cart right. looking at the ocean. Exactly. And he's basically sold his company for $4.5 billion. <laughs> Yeah. And we, we have interactions. But this goes to environment. And I remember the first time, like, you and, when you and I started getting out of Columbus, Ohio, because Columbus, Ohio, we did have good exposure, but very limited good exposure to people that were big thinkers. Sure. You had to really go out of your way. And smaller, you had to search it out. Yeah, in smaller communities like where we're from, um, you have to really search it out. And even then, there's not going to be that many. But when we started to travel more, you can get exposure and control and change your environment from reading books and you know doing things like that. But really what makes the biggest difference is going out of your way and going to the places where the people, where it usually, you know, seek out places that make you uncomfortable. That's really kind of what we did originally. That's right. I remember when you and I would travel out of, you know, again, where we grew up, and we started going to these other areas where it was a high density of very wealthy people. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time we went down to Palm Beach. I remember the right, first time Miami we went to Beach Miami and, and Beach, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. First time we went to Southern California, the first sure. time, you know, and we used to drive there. We didn't have money to fly there, just <laughs> for the record, right? right? And I remember seeing how people, you know, are basically our age, a little bit older, were living. And then, of course, our real estate brains were going, well, no wonder they're having such a better lifestyle. <laughs> Because when you do three, our average sale price our first year in the like business $10. Was, was was like 180 grand, right? Yeah. When we got out of the business, it was closer to like 800 grand. But the point of it is, is when you start doing, you know, say, for example, and not saying this is what commission rates, well, this is what they were. When you do 3% of 180 grand versus when you go down to, say, for example, Laguna Beach, California, and you're doing 3% of, say, 1.5 million, it doesn't take or too more. long yeah. to figure out that that is a substantially different environment. And their, uh, how they exist on planet Earth is different than us. I remember having conversations with <laughs> yeah. people on these trips where they're like, you know, yeah, we're going on vacation. And where we're from, going on vacation was going up to Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. you know, the woo! Buckeye Riviera. They call it the Buckeye Riviera, where they were just like jetting off to Dubai. And I'm not even making these stories up. But that's, yeah. that's exposure. And it did make us incredibly uncomfortable, which we adored. We loved it. And, you know, the, the, it the, makes you think bigger at the end of the day. Well, the challenge all of us has, have as we get older, this is the reason I liked that experience yesterday, right? A guy who's exactly 10 years younger than, you know, <laughs> Julie and I. And, well, yeah. I'm not supposed to say Julie's age, you. but I just did. <laughs> yeah, 10 yeah. years younger than me. Julie's 35 forever. Exactly. But anyway, so when we were, uh, like, having that exposure, it's constant reminder that you can't be complacent. Constant reminder to always think bigger. But this goes, again, to environment. So if your environment of where you live and most people, this is a statistic from the Social Security Administration, which I think is very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. I remember when you and it's I very first, consistent, too. Yeah, it's something like 99% of everyone, even with the mobility that we all have, are born and uh, die within a 25-mile radius, mm -hmm. I think it was, at yeah. the exact same spot. Now, COVID may be changing that, but it's right. still pretty consistent. It's still going to be pretty high up there. And obviously, there's more mobility the more money you make, because then people have the flexibility of living in different places more easily and travel and yeah, the rest but of let's, it. Yeah, but let's reel this back into your brokerage, right? So, you know, I when you were talking, I was remembering, you know, we used to, in some markets you still do this, you go to roundtable closings, everybody shows up, it was in the real estate office, it was mm -hmm. in the title company, whatever, and I remember going to some of these brokerages, man, 
And it's like just finding it in the first place. Like, am I really supposed to be in this part of town? And then it's, are you kidding me? The brokerage is in the basement of that building. It was the joke was brokerages and, and they, they get broker they, and broker. They do yeah. brokerages uh, and they fix screen, screen doors. doors. I mean, and... didn't you actually go to a brokerage for yes. closing once? And their side hustle was fixing screen doors. Yes, and I kid you not. And this, I mean, they were doing their uh, settlement statements on a typewriter. Okay, <laughs> this is not all right. Now they did have computers when we sold. And real yes, estate. there were computers at the time, but they were still using typewriters. So for you guys, this would be like if your brokerage email address is AOL, you may have a problem. Or if yours is, or let's yours just be is. honest. Some of you still use AOL. Yeah. So environment matters, and if you are the biggest fish consistently, you may need to be getting out and being more challenged. If you're surrounded by negativity in your office, that's not normal. That's not okay for you. I know it seems like that's normal when, you know, maybe you tune in and you're not following a media free morning. Well, what's, what's, your res, what's your resistance to being exposed to people, places, thoughts, experiences that are completely different than the ones you're having now? What's your resistance? If you feel, as you're listening to Julie and I talk, if you're having any negative thoughts about what we're saying right now, it's your inner skeptic, a.k.a. your ego, which is trying to keep you from uh, thinking bigger because your ego wants you to stay in fear and protection mode forever. And if you start having thoughts that might actually put you in a, uh, in a situation where you're unfamiliar, something inside of you, and this happens for everyone, but more as you get older, is going to say, hazard, hazard, don't do that. Don't right. take that risk, right? So if you're hearing Julie and I tell these stories and you think we're bragging, we're not bragging. We're sharing with you a true story, and we're sharing that with you because we were just like you guys. Hell, we still are. We have to go out of our way to keep ourselves challenged so we don't become complacent. And this is, to Julie's point, thank you for ruling me back in, Sure. 100% about your environment. So if you're in an environment right now where everyone is the same as you, looks the same, same age, drives the same car, has the same thoughts, does the same things at the same times of the day you do, chances are you can look, find somebody who's like 20 years older than you, and that's where you're going to be in 20 years. And maybe that's mm-hmm. great. Maybe you love that. Maybe that's perfect. And you not judging. You might be judging, lucky. But you might be in a good place. In some ways, find yourself and put yourself in a different environments and put yourself in different environments that with people that do challenge your – you know, I'm going to tell a story that's not completely appropriate, but I think our podcast listeners will love it. Mm, I love how you're not warning me about your stories today. But well, go ahead. No, it's, it's the first okay. time we went to Laguna Beach. And okay. you and I were going on sure. a long walk. And okay. I remember walking, and you and I, this is when we were still living in Columbus. We'd never, this is one of our first or second times out okay. of, of uh, you know, maybe it wasn't Laguna. It was somewhere in Southern California. Sure. It was a long walk. Mm-hmm. So I'm filling <laughs> and in. And there blind. was sunshine involved. Well, yeah, there was. There's sunshine <laughs> involved and, you yeah. know, a lot of happy, smiley people. Yeah. So we're going on a walk, and I remember it's this, you know, five-mile walk and whatever from one end to the other. Mm-hmm. Again, I might be patching stories together in my brain, okay. but this is the gist of it. And I remember um, <coughs> seeing a person in front of us, mm-hmm. a lady that was in really, really good shape. You and mm-hmm. I both noticed her. Sure. And, she, and we were like pacing ourselves against her. Mm-hmm. And she was like super fast. Yeah. And she was she was fit. Yes. Yeah. And I remember mm-hmm. catching up with her and we finally passed her because, of course, Julie and I are competitive. <laughs> and then I remember yeah. as we passed her, glancing at her, and she was at least in her 60s. Yes. And I thought to myself. I remember that. Yeah. I mm-hmm. thought, well, it was because it made a profound effect. Sure. Because at that moment, mm-hmm. we and we were just basically still using our Midwest mm-hmm. standards, right? People look a certain way, act a certain way, yeah. especially as you get older. Yeah. You're, you kind of fall into this. Like people in the Midwest where we're from. And we love the Midwest. We love where we're from. But people have a tendency at certain ages to all look the same and act the same. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yes. And I do think the colder the weather is, the more likely this is to happen because, you know, you're covering yourself up most of the year. Yeah, exactly. You're not out there. You're not working out. You know, I think it happens, you know, the whole northern half of the country is like this. But when we saw that, I remember it reframed it for us. Right. Like you don't have to carry that weight around. You don't have to you know, kind of just be good enough when you get to a certain age. Well, we were and we ran gym. into the gym this morning. The guy was exactly. sick. What is he, 67? 67. Yeah, he's out there. And he was like, what was he, bench pressing? Like, No, no, he wasn't bench was pressing. He, he was he was doing, I, back I, I, don't even know what the, I don't even know what it was called. Lifting a lot of weight. He was lifting the equivalent of Julie and I's weight combined is what yeah. he was doing. And he did it like 10 times. And I looked at him, I go, that's <laughs> yeah. amazing. I, you know, I, he I, I, I couldn't stop myself. I know. It, it, You're like, go, how is that? happening <laughs> yeah but that, that again that was a fair example you know yeah. of, of those types of things so it, it that's exposure to how people condition themselves to want to look and feel better longer in their lives which then will change the behaviors that they would have so if you're exposed to that like we were in our form more formidable years 
then it starts to condition our brains to think, well, we're not supposed to be getting fat slower as we get older, right? right. As most people do. And by and the way, you don't have to. You can take good care of yourself. Most people get fat as they get older, not because they're eating more, but because their metabolism slows down and they're eating the same as they ate when they were younger. That's and really probably the, exercising less. Right. So anyway, these are just well, environmental and, and, things. You know, we have a big section about this in the Harris Rules book where we're talking about upgrading everything. And I think that your brokerage can fit into that category if necessary. So that's what this is about. Point number four, it might be time to make a change. If your brokerage requires you to attend too many mandatory meetings and other time-consuming non-dollar productive activities, you are not going to sell real estate to each other. You're all licensed. So this doesn't make any sense. All right, point number five. Your broker or office manager shoots down every idea that isn't 1970s, 80s, 90s <laughs> traditional real estate. The broker offers no tech support or lame tech support or has no added value for being an agent with their office. They've never even heard of the metaverse, refer to previous podcasts, and certainly are not operating within it. We hear that actually a lot from small brokers. We do. New sure. agents will join our coaching program and they'll say, I've got this incredible PLP and you know, it's got these USPs, and they'll go to the broker, and their broker will be like, what the hell is a USP? Oh, you know, get out. They, they'll say, well, you can't do that. You can't, you do, can't that. do that. No. And then the agents will call us and say, my broker won't let me do these things. And and what should I do? And you know what we tell you? And what we'll tell you if you ever ask that question? Choose a different broker. Because yeah. you must. Because that broker is thinking very small. The mm -hmm. probability of you succeeding in that environment is nil. Point number six. Point number six, your broker takes a cut out of every source of income. Home warranty sales, processing fees, stuff like that. Point number seven, your broker offers no real support uh, for help beyond uh, transactions. In other words, your broker essentially is operating as a- well, You're hanging your license there and that's about it. Right. And again, if you're, it, you might be very successful in your career and you want no broker uh, in, interaction whatsoever. You want minimal interaction. You want, min, you want to you know, play by the rules. You want to get your stuff in the CRM. You don't want to have to actually, you know- have a bunch of Mickey Mouse that the broker overlays on you. And that unfortunately is what happens in a lot of these brokerages. But a lot of brokers and a lot of office managers try to justify their existences by being bureaucrats, by giving you more forms to fill out, by making the process well, more that's complicated. True, isn't it? It Extra is true. forms on top of the forms that are required. Right. It's like broker overlays. It is. You know, it is. And, oh, we have to do it because of errors in emissions mm -hmm. insurance. No, you have to do it because you think this is what you're supposed to be doing because you're you know trying to justify your existence at this brokerage. Or you're trying to basically, you know, keep yourself busy at the end of the day. Really, guys, here's the real bottom line for these points that we're giving you. A real estate brokerage, and I know this sounds, you know, counterintuitive should not think of themselves in the house selling business. They should they are in the real estate business legally, but a real estate brokerage, a good real estate brokerage is not in the housing business necessarily. They're in the agent business. They or they should be. Right. right. A good real estate brokerage is going to be in the agent, you know, cultivating, caring, feeding and uh, maturing business, not in the housing business. And when you find these conflicts, a lot of times it's because the broker has confused themselves as to what their role is. So if you want a broker whose primary and really only focus is going to be on making sure that you are a successful agent, not that, you know, that's really the bottom line. Well, it plays into point number eight, which you are not getting the education, the motivation or action steps that you personally need to succeed. That's a very common thing that we hear from incoming coaching clients is that they feel like they're just swimming out there with no direction. They're not getting motivation. They're, they're, they don't even know what education to ask for. They don't know what they don't know. And nobody's helping them figure it out. And that's really the fast track to being real estate roadkill because you do have to have somebody look in and say, you know what? Are you using a pre-listing package? Is it different than everyone else in your brokerage? Does it show what makes you different? Do you know how to present it? Do you know how to close, handle objections? All of those things. And if you're not getting that motivation, education, and action steps, a real business plan, you know, how do you figure out your finances? How do you do your goal setting? How do you actually succeed? If you're not getting that, you are not getting the support that you need. Well, we should have added a supplemental point to that one. It's, you know, very, very salient. Is your broker like branding and all the rest of it. So one of the things we talked about, we talk about this frequently, is when you have a real estate sign, do all this legally depending on your states. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this before in the, and we talked about this in the coaching program. Always have your phone number, not the broker's phone number. Always have all your identifiable information, not the broker's information. But what you'll discover is a lot of the brokerages are going to want you to uh, brand, and you know, branding is a big generalized term. What they're going to do is minimize your name, minimize any yeah. um, essentially 
um, brand. Promote the and, brokerage over yourself. And they want the brokerage over yourself. And sometimes you guys come to us and say, my brokerage is paying for $50,000 worth or $150,000 or you know, $10,000 for my marketing per year. And let me guess, you have to use their marketing department mm -hmm. and their name's going to be all over their it. Their compliance. Your name's going to be in the back of the card or whatever it is on, in black and white with their phone number. They're not doing anything for you. And guess what? You are paying whatever they're giving you in your form of your commission split. You're getting nothing. And you think that they're promoting you with that marketing spend, but they're really promoting the brokerage. Exactly. And they're doing it to placate your ego so you think you got some sort of special handout from your brokerage because, after all, you're so special. What you want to look Pretty for crafty, is – Pretty crafty, really. Really. I mean, it is. So, again, next point. Point number nine, your brokerage offers no revenue share. It's time to leave. Because here's the old rule. The old rule is, you know, the agents would always talk about, what are you paying your broker? The new rule should be, what is your brokerage paying you? And revenue share is one of the things you always have to look out for. It's, it, the, frankly, it's the it's one of the, what, seven wonders of the world. It's the Absolutely eighth wonder. It is. When you understand how, and there's only really two, I think, brokerages out there that offer true revenue share. And I'll just give this quick consolidated understanding of what revenue share is versus profit share. Like big brokerages, like Keller Williams offers profit share, but profit share is something that comes off the bottom of the brokerages. Uh, like for example, the money comes into the brokerage, you have some agent that you brought into that particular brokerage and uh, whatever is left in the form of profit that shows up on that broker's balance sheet, that then is uh, shared proportionately depending on what you're supposedly owed. That is all predicated on what? There being profit from that brokerage, right? Which you also have no control over. Right. And so you don't have any control over that. So you are not in a situation where you can actually, you know, predictably expect any sort of, you know, essentially a recurring revenue source from any profit share scheme. And that's just the way it works. Scheme's not a bad word, by the way. Now, with a revenue share, the reason that's much more transparent is because it comes off the top. When money comes into a brokerage and it's a revenue share model, you know what you're going to get because of the disclosed amount that's supposed to be paid based on essentially if you sponsored somebody at that particular brokerage. So look for a revenue share because – and also ultimately what you want to look for is a brokerage – that it actually leads into our next point and you know really the bottom line look for a brokerage again that's going to create multiple sources multiple streams of income for you because you're doing the transaction anyway so if you're brand new in real estate let me make this real simple every time you do a deal there are dozens of people that are getting paid why aren't you getting paid as a result of all of them getting paid it doesn't make any sense nothing happens if you don't do that real estate deal so the big ones mortgage getting paid titles getting paid and appraisers getting paid there's all these ancillary service providers. You're, you got your bug guy. Your, you home know, inspectors, home, home inspectors. warranties. The all these people are getting mm -hmm. paid. Why are you generating the transaction? And why aren't they paying you for what comes as a result of what was your work? So you see how when you're essentially where you are in the food chain as far as getting paid, you're, you're not. You the, were the lead generator. You were the lead that. generator. You're the one that gave up your nights and weekends. And you're not making any ancillary income from the fact that you created income for all these dozens of other people. So if you're only making one income, which would be your commission, you need to look at other models. That's really the bottom line. And so that's the reason, again, that's another, uh, as people wake up to realize, especially when they're feeling little headwinds in the economy from inflation or whatever, True. they start questioning the sanity of sticking with a brokerage. Uh, based on maybe commission splits, like a lot of time commission splits, that's all it really takes for someone to understand why they need to leave. Or maybe it's something like, you know, like we said, creating ancillary services or forms of income. You don't want to be building a real estate business with as much effort and time it takes and keep yourself on a production uh, transactional hamster wheel forever. Doesn't it make sense that you would want to have income that's coming in from passive sources that are not predicated, not dependent on you doing a real estate transaction? That is what you should definitely demand from any real estate brokerage. Yes. Yeah, so let's see the point number 11 10. 10 okay your broker offers no opportunities to purchase stock or offer stock awards a stock award is literally when it is awarded to you you didn't purchase it many brokerages are public companies but only one offers stock rewards discounts for purchase and more to your previous point don't make your money in only just one way your transaction Point number 11, you have to, I always hear this in coaching all the time, you have to work too hard to get your questions answered and feel like you're all alone. Not so with certain companies that we might be talking about. So here's really the bottom line, guys. Julie and I have been in the real estate business for 
almost 30, well, I don't even want to say it, but almost 30 years. It is. We, bought our fir- we did our first real estate transaction when we were 22 and 23. Mm-hmm. Um, and in all that time, we, we were, when, and we started coaching full-time after we were in real, selling real estate, sold thousands of homes, and we started having people ask us to coach them. This is before the coaching industry was even really, especially it in existence. real estate, no one knew what it was. We didn't even know what it was. We just said yes and figured it out mm-hmm. along the way. Yeah. True story. Uh, but in any event, uh, we have never seen anything like EXP Realty. There has been big brokerage brands that have come and gone over you know, our careers, even before we got into real estate. But we have never seen anything that, that is essentially as agent-centric in the truest sense as EXP Realty. Everyone says they're agent-centric, but they don't put their wallet where their mouths are. They say, oh, we care about agents. Agents are the most important thing. Well, then why is it that the agents are the ones that are growing old broke? Why are they, is it the agents are failing out of the brokerage at such a, you know, in, at the industry at such an incredible rate? Why is it that agents are the ones that never create, create any financial um, you know, wealth, really, any financial security, let alone wealth? It's because agents are not choosing brokerages that are truly broker-centric. They're choosing brokerages that are just maybe offering them cheapest commission split. Or essentially, they're not even putting much thought into realizing how much money they're leaving on the table and opportunity they're leaving on the table by working with the brokerage that they're working with. All of that changed when Julie and I discovered eXp Realty. There is no question in our minds um, that eXp Realty is a brokerage that all of you need to be taking a serious look at no matter where you sell real estate, at what price point, and now that EXP is in, what, 21 different countries, mm-hmm. chances are EXP is available in your country as well. EXP is going to change all the rules about how, frankly, brokerages and agents interact. EXP has a metaverse. EXP offers revenue share. EXP offers health insurance. EXP offers uh, essentially stock. It's a publicly traded company. EXP offers all the technology you'd ever want to have at a price that is oftentimes substantially lower than what um, your well, local brokerage always. is. Almost, almost always, always, right. Yes. I mean, well, I, I think until EXP came around, because we've been in the space forever, as you said, we, I mean, really, most brokerages were fairly similar. They had similar problems. They had, you know, maybe one had a better location or maybe the broker was more friendly, but there wasn't a real differentiation for the agent standpoint. There wasn't, uh, I mean, Nobody even offered health insurance. Nobody had revenue share. Nobody had stock awards. This is innovative, and it was born in the cloud. It was born in the metaverse. They're not trying to play catch up. And, you know, that last point about not being able to get help when you want it, all you have to do is go into EXP world, type in what you want, go to the building. Somebody is live there. Answer. I used it the other day to get an E&O insurance question answered. Yep. So, what would you normally have to do? Track down somebody? Again, you, the disadvantage that all of you have is have, have you not explored what eXp has to offer is that other agents in your marketplace are moving over to eXp. You know that's true. And because of the way eXp's revenue share model works, the early bird definitely is going to get the worm in your local mm-hmm. markets. So you need to be opening your mind to you know thinking about it. Maybe I'll look at it later. Take action on this now, especially as the economy starts to change. Because what EXP is going to do for many of you is create a source of income that's beyond what you're getting from real estate transaction, that's not predicated on a real estate transaction, that will create an opportunity for you to make it so that one day sooner than you think, you have enough money coming in where you are using our definition rich, where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. There are so many reasons you have to take a hard look at this, especially this time of year, really any time of year. So we made it easy for you. We're going to give you two paths to move forward here. You, if you're ready to join EXP and you're looking for the right sponsor, Julie and I are formally and enthusiastically applying for the job of being your EXP sponsor. Text me directly, 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. Don't make the wrong decision as a new agent and join the wrong brokerage. Don't make continue to make the wrong decision if you're at the wrong brokerage now and you're making one of these 11 mistakes after you've asked yourself and maybe your brokerage the questions that Julie just gave to you. Think about where you want to be 12 months from now. Think about where you could be 12 months from now. Think about how much better your quality of your life is going to be for you and your loved ones. If you choose to start exposing yourself to different environments, different people, different thoughts, you know, think bigger, guys. You only live once and you're dead a real long time. What the heck are you waiting for? That's right. And so now if you're just getting getting started learning about eXp, 
That's fine too. Text the letters EXP to 47372, and then we'll text you back a link, and you can go to a website that we created that answers all of your questions. But if, for those of you who are smart and you want to move forward now and you're ready to join EXP, text me directly at 512-758-0206. Anything else you'd like to say to these guys? Well, you know, some of you guys might just feeling like you're kind of okay with where you are. Being okay, being middle of the road, you shouldn't be okay with that. You should want to be exceptional. You got into real estate. You know, when you got your license and you took your test and you were so excited, oh my gosh, I, I passed it. I'm licensed agent. You were so excited for your future. And if you're not feeling that way every single day, it's time to make a change. Right. And guys, join us. We'd love to partner with you at eXp Realty. So text me at 512-758-0206. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com. <laughs>